And we're back. But where this time? How about we settle in with a quiet sunset over the harbour at Port Elgin, Ontario? That should be pleasant, but not too distracting, as we continue with my series of videos about Call Me By Your Name. In 2007, university professor, essayist and author Andre Asiman published his first novel, Call Me By Your Name. The story of first love made many best of the year lists and the film rights were immediately optioned. It was 10 years though before the film hit screens and along the way there were plenty of twists and turns in making that happen. Fans of the novel, a pretty ardent group, were looking for something worthy of their beloved exquisitely written main characters and the team creating the film were, it seems, equally as committed to delivering something great as the outcome now attests to. In this two-part video, I'm going to look at some of the twists in the road that the film took to get made, focusing on changes made to the story. The most obvious and overarching adjustment is the new setting, transcribed, as it were, like Elio does with music, where he rearranges orchestral works for piano or guitar. James Ivory and Luca Guadagnino rearranged locations from Andre Osman's painstakingly crafted seaside setting in Liguria to the lovingly assembled countryside of Lombardy. It's been incredibly deftly done. Let's look at the details. The Perlman Villa is the natural spot to begin. It's practically a character in itself, the backdrop to 90% of the story with the way the bedrooms in particular are set up that facilitate Elio's double-edged interaction with Oliver and which are crucial to how the story plays out. Every year, Elio moves one bedroom along the corridor into a much smaller one, a mark of the Perlman family's hospitality, but which also symbolizes the general displacement of Elio's life while the summer student visits. The finding of a villa for the film that closely parallels the layout of the house in the book, no set had to be built, we're getting authenticity here, is remarkable given the minimal differences that arguably accentuate the imposition and interaction in the film. In the book, it's the balcony doors that amplify the connection between the bedrooms, while in the film, the bedrooms share a bathroom and another door. These thresholds both separate and unite Elio and Oliver depending upon their intentions at any given time. The film house also has a balcony for those important clandestine nighttime meetings just down the hall, so that plot device is taken care of as well. In the book, the house overlooks the Mediterranean Sea, with a beach below it accessed by steps cut into the steep shoreline. Its yard includes an orchard, a pool, and a tennis court. In the film, the sea and the beach are gone, replaced by lush greenery and a river to swim in, while the pool and orchard remain. The seaside tennis court is replaced by grounds large enough to host neighborhood volleyball games, while both homes also boast gorgeous spots to dine al fresco with guests who are present for so many meals. So why the move in the first place? In the novel, Asiman sets the house outside a town only referred to as B. One could say that the novelist was looking to downplay the exact location in comparison to the importance of the events that take place in the novel. But I say it's because B is not so much like one real Italian Riviera town with that initial, but two. Luca Guadagnino has told interviewers that when he was initially brought onto the team to create the film, he was there to act as the Italian fixer and location scout. He identified B for the producers as Bordighera, a seaside town about 10 kilometers from the Italian border with France, and one can find analogues for many of the town sites from the book in Bordighera, most notably Monet's Berm, the oh-so-important location of Elio and Oliver's first tryst. Monet did live in Bordighera for a time and painted there. 
I'm using some images of Monet's Bordighera paintings along with the Apple Maps views to convey the town's feeling. There are a couple problems with Bordighera, however, if you want to film this story there. It's generally more built up than the setting that Asaman creates in the novel, and if you go hoping to find a suitable inspiration for the Perlman's villa, you will not find seaside houses in Bordighera that fit the bill. Its Mediterranean coastline is all tourist beaches and roads and train tracks. To the west, there are some seaside homes with larger properties beyond Ventimiglia. And I wonder if places like the massive Hanbury estate or some of the villas across the border in France, like at Cap Martin, may have been inspirations. The closest homes to Bordighera that are not separated from the beach by rails and the coastal road are in a hamlet about three kilometers to the east called Madonna della Rota. While there are a couple of impressive properties there, none quite fit the description of the Perlman's villa's semi-remote location and extensive grounds. And east of Madonna della Rota, we get right back into built-up towns again. The second place that somewhat fits Asaman's B initial is a locale 175 kilometers away to the east of Genoa called Boliasco, where Asaman has spent some time at an academic foundation. Boliasco does have villas whose properties cascade down to the sea, even if that town may also be a little too densely built up to provide a property large enough to pose as the Perlman's villa. Essentially, the B of the book is a made-up place inspired by two towns that Andre Osman has spent some time in, while the villa also blends in some imaginative details from larger estates. So it would take some real cinematic trickery to replicate the Perlman Villa somewhere along the densely packed Italian Riviera. I'm not saying there are no prospective filming locations between Bordighera and Boliasco that the production team could have set up shop in, and I would love to know if they had gotten as far as choosing one or multiple locations to represent the Perlman's villa. But they did determine a budget for an Italian Riviera-located version of Call Me By Your Name, which was $12 million. And that was nearly four times more than they were eventually able to raise. When plans for the Italian Riviera version of the film were abandoned, and James Ivory, until then just a producer on the film, was asked to also become the film's director, he wrote a new screenplay. In it, he moved the action to Sicily, which has countless miles of less densely built-up coastline, if somewhat hotter, drier, and comparatively impoverished, and where the budget could have been cut by about half. Again, I would love to know if a particular house had been found to play the Perlman's villa. But the Sicilian version was similarly abandoned as the production team sought to dramatically cut the budget again to a figure that they could foresee raising. Sicily, though, had provided Ivory with a reason to give Professor Perlman, who was fairly lightly sketched in the book, an academic specialty that being Greco-Roman antiquities, as Sicily boasts a treasure trove of ancient Greek and Roman archaeological sites. It's unclear exactly what the professor's specialty is in the book, but by making him an art and archaeology expert, Ivory gave him a particularly cinematic expertise, studies from which would lend themselves, for example, to exploring the sensuality of Praxiteles' statuary, the way that Elio was similarly studying a certain statuesque somebody. The last change of location to Lombardy coincided with the raising of Luca Guadagnino initially to co-director and eventually to sole director of the film. Setting the filming around Crema meant that Guadagnino could work from home and work with his hometown crew, so fewer hotel bills, and a region to film in that would provide plenty of quiet locations where one could shoot with less hassle and less expensively. The movie House, as mentioned, was an incredible find. Villa Albergoni, a 16th century stunner, simply oozes long-faded Milanese Renaissance bourgeois wealth 
its dilapidated charms accentuated by its dressing for the film, playing the perfectly patented palace of a vacation home for a professor of antiquities and his translator wife. Villa Albergoni is located in the hamlet of Moscazzano, about nine kilometers to the south of Crema, and in the film, there's no pretending that they are not there, as the hamlet's name comes up in an early scene, as does that of another village close by, Montodine, and Crema itself is named too. For some shooting locations, the team had to go a little bit off the direct route between Moscazzano and Crema, most notably to Pandino, west of Crema, for its perfect Piave monument, around which one of the story's most pivotal scenes was filmed. Overall, the relocated setting for Call Me By Your Name works wonderfully for the story, especially those bike rides, arguably more enjoyably cycled than in the original setting, assuming Elio and Oliver are happier to be going down the quiet and flat roads of the Lombardy countryside in place of the chaotic, narrow, twisty, hilly, and busy roads of the Italian Riviera. Before Oliver leaves for home, he and Elio take off for a few days. In the book, they go to Rome, where they have an extensive adventure with sophisticated new characters from the city's arts and letters scene. It's terrifically engaging in the book, but it would have complicated and lengthened the film no end. Instead of going to the distant and expensive Italian capital, in the film, a visit to the nearby university town of Bergamo replaces it, saving some money and lots of running time, while also heightening the culmination of Elio and Oliver's relationship. Ivory also finds a way to dispatch Oliver more quickly and cleanly from Elio's life here. Yes, it's much messier in the book. By inexorably pulling Oliver away by locomotive, and by having Oliver only call at Christmas time instead of returning to the house to torture Elio in person with his devastating news. So this is where considering the relocation of the story moves into creating a more concise story for the film. Getting what was a seven and three quarter hour long audiobook reading by Army Hammer down to a two hour, 12 minute movie. You have to play both with characters and plot points to accomplish that. And to get it right, you want to distill the essence of the story while preserving its characteristics. To that end, the film's script, directorial choices, and editing is pretty much a miracle of concision, accomplished by James Ivory, Luca Guadagnino, and Walter Fasano, and it's what I'm going to talk about in part two of Book to Script to Screen. Please come back for that. <laughs>